So he wasn't going out and having a good time, partying and everything else like that, but he became habituated. So his brain believed the only way you're going to have a good time with your children is by taking that Vicodin. It's powerful how, addiction, how this addictive process can happen. So now, now, there's a brain issue here as well, and we're going to talk about it, especially with Vicodin. But I will tell you, I'll reflect once again on how powerful this addiction is. I just told you, I, started, I, there's, I don't drink alcohol, right? And I saw the deleterious effects of alcohol on my brother, and nothing I could do about it. And I've been working here for 31 years. So I know how bad alcoholism is, right? Well, about, about maybe seven or eight years ago, I was one of those idiots that, you know, drove my motorcycle 200 miles an hour. I mean, I was racing motorcycles, racing cars, and everything else like that, and I love them. I rebuild them. As a matter of fact, I'm OCD, so I rebuilt those motorcycles better than they were when I bought them, right? And I had one motorcycle that would do an honest 200 and something miles an hour. I know why. Because I drove it 200 and something miles an hour. And my wife was get fed up. She says, you're going to have to get rid of those. You're going to kill yourself. The, the grandkids won't have a grandfather. Your kids won't have a father. I'm like, yeah, you're absolutely right. I sold everything. Sold everything I had, right? And I was depressed about it. My wife came out and said, I know you're depressed about getting rid of all your stuff. But as long as I've talked to you, you said you wanted to get yourself a horse. Now, we had a mini horse, right? But he was like a pet. And we had seven dogs and 12 chickens and two goats and everything else. But we didn't have no horses. My wife says, you've got to get yourself a horse. And then you'll feel good. You ride your horse, you know? Get that adrenaline out, right? I say, that sounds like a good idea. So I go down. I find the horse I want. It's a, I don't know anything about horses. It's a thoroughbred. And she's wild and beautiful. And I want her. And the lady comes up to me and she goes, oh, I can be honest with you. I know, I know you like the horse and everything else, but truth and disclosure, we bought this horse to train this horse for my daughter to do dressage. And so far, two trainers have been injured badly with this horse. And she goes, I'm not going to sell this horse to you unless I know for sure you got a lot of experience with horses. You know? Well, I thought back, and I'm you know, a little white lie. My horse was eight years old. I said, ma'am, I've been working with horses every day for eight years. <laughs> I should have known when I got the horse into the trailer, she broke both my toes. Rearing up, right? And then I got her home, and after 30 days of being, uh, you know, I thought I watched, I watched Clinton Anderson. I know how to ride this horse. Yeehaw! That horse hurt me more than I've ever been hurt in my entire life. Racing motorcycles, right? Anyway, sorry to digress, but the long, I have five horses now, and all my wife can say is I wish she had those motorcycles back. But anyway, <laughs> that's why I'm sorry. Here's what happened, though. So this horse, oh, get this. What was the horse's name? Daisy. I'm like, okay, you're not Daisy no more. You're Taya, which means spirited one, right? And so anyway, um, I, got, I come to terms with Taya. She, I never broke her. I ride her now bareback and everything else like that. But I have to admit it. I sometimes would have a little dread go out and ride her. Everybody would say, oh, Dad, she's going to kill you. You know what I mean? And everything else. You know, no, 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 we're not riding her. You know what I mean? I can't One day, it's like 4th of July. Some people come over. They bring alcohol. Mm. I don't drink. I drank three, I think three blue moons. I don't know, but I was drunk, really drunk. So I went and rode on my horse, right? I had the best ride I ever had in my entire life. That horse would just turn with me just thinking about turning her. I was showing off. I was jumping over the fence with her for the people that were there. And I was like, wow, a magnificent horse rider he is, right? right? That was like on a Wednesday, I think. Friday, I came home from work. And I told my wife, I said, I'm going to take Tay up on that really sketchy trail back there in the Mount, A Mountains, right? The, the Wausau Peak, I think, whatever they call it. And uh, my wife said, oh, yeah, you're going to trust her on that trail and everything else? I said, yeah, I mean, she rode really good last time, you know. I went outside, you know what I said to myself? Hey, I think I'll go down and buy a six-pack first. Mm -hmm. One time! And I know my brother died from alcoholism, and I'm working with alcoholics. One time, my brain was impelled to make myself relax. So I ride Taya better. Luckily, I said, no, no, you don't do that. Six months from now, you just be drunk riding your horses. You know what I mean? That's all you do. So I said, what else can I do? Because I knew the horse was feeding my anxiety. So I got some Bluetooth headphones. I put my favorite song on. And I rode that horse. She rode like a breeze. So now people say, do you still wear Bluetooth when you ride Taya? Oh, you bet. I'm going to get run over by a truck because I can't hear him beeping. But I got a good ride, right? So anyway, I'm, I'm just... I, I just say that because I want to emphasize how quickly people can become habituated when they have that brain pathway that says this is what you're supposed to do. And it's very, very hard to get out of that. And that neural pathway doesn't go away. Now, we don't know if substance use, we're going to be able to find some genetic or something like that. I don't think so, to be honest with you. All right. 
But there are certain substances that seem to be more critically brain-related than others. And we already just talked about the fact that you can downregulate neurotransmitters and neuromodulators based on the behavior that you're engaging in. But let's talk about opioids for a minute, okay? Because we know opioids are the scourge of the land, right? People are dropping dead of overdoses. It's everywhere, right? And um, why is that? Well, opioids, remember I told you they make you feel good, they do euphoric. But opioids do something else, right? They capture the dopamine pathway responsible for instinct to survive. Did you hear that? I mean, this is critical, right? If we got on a plane right now and flew over Antarctica and the plane crashed, it would be that pathway in our brain that says, hey, find fire, find shelter, find water, all that kind of stuff. In other words, let's stay alive. Let's figure out how to stay alive. That's that dopamine pathway driving us for that survival. So if dopamine captures, if opioids capture your drive for survival, so then that fellow going out there looking for heroin, his brain thinks he's looking for fire and warmth and water and food. That's pretty incredible. You know, one time I took care of a patient here. This individual was in the ICU for I can't remember now, but it was like six months or something. It was incredible. What happened was he was injected heroin, and he got an infection. He got septic. The infection went to his heart. He developed endocarditis, and then his kidneys and, and every, his organs started shutting down. He had no more pulmonary emboli. This man was as close to death as you can get. In fact, I don't even think the doctor saved him. I think God saved that young man. He got out of the hospital, the ICU, went out and started injecting heroin again. I know he came back to the hut, got admitted here, right? And he was, uh, my partner saw him at the time, did a physical exam on him, and I didn't see him till the next day. And I came in, the first thing he said to me, he says, hey, I, I can't even walk, I got no energy, I, I just don't know what's going on. I'm like, well, you're detoxing, right? But then when I listened to his heart, I heard a bad murmur. I'm like, oh, there's a murmur here. So I checked uh, blood cultures on him. And I'll remember this to the day I die. I was driving the Pima County Fair, right? And I got a phone call from the lab saying, oh, his cultures are positive. I'm like, oh no, he's septic, right? So I called up the infectious disease doctor that took care of him at the hospital. I said, look, I got this young man here. He's septic, I need you to put him in the ICU. And you know what he said to me? He said, oh, he goes, I treated that staph infection with everything I had. I got nothing left. He, goes, I he said, I can't believe it came back. I said, no, this isn't a staph infection. This is Klebsiella. And boom, the floor, I mean, you could have heard the phone drop. It was two minutes before he got back on the phone with him and he said, he said to me, stuttering, well, that means he used again. That means he's injecting heroin again. I said, yes, sir, he is. So, see, the reason why he was so aghast is because, well, not just because of circumstances, but because he could not, he didn't know about that capture of dopamine pathways. He just like this young man who's given the gift of life who's that relapsed again. But when you capture dopamine pathways for your instinct to survive, that is a very, very powerful addiction in the brain. Not just a habituation, but a powerful addiction in the brain. And I know you guys all know, it's very hard to get these patients off of these type of things. That's why medication-assisted medication therapies like buprenorphine and methadone, all those things are, are popular right now. Because they help. And when you're, you're dealing with something that's life-threatening, you want to do anything that you can to help. You know, and they do make an impact, you know. But anyway, so for substance use disorder, there's a, there's a brain-related issue here. The only question that I have is I don't, I don't necessarily think it's genetic. I don't think you're going to find some marker genetic mutation. Now, maybe someone's got a predisposition. I guess it's possible. You know, but that's possible true with all those type of things. Let's talk about one more thing. Um, do you have any questions about everything that we just talked about? Because I think I went over a whole lot of stuff already and I've been talking Talk about kind of endorphins. Excuse me? Endorphins? Yeah, endorphins. Yeah. Natural opioids. Responsible to, to relieve pain. And of course, that's why opioids or narcotics relieve pain, is because they bind at endorphin sites. And and actually there's some evidence that dopamine may regulate and actually modulate endorphin sites as well. So they're kind of tied in closely together. Yeah. And uh, also, that's another, that's an important point because, you know, we all dealt with heroin addicts that on their day two of their exam, they tell you they've got the worst pain in the world. It's a 10 out of 10. They got cramps so bad and everything else. But guess what? They don't have any endorphins. So really, a pinch to them feels like a knuckle punch, you know. 
because they don't have the natural uh, endorphins. There's down regulation occur in all these neurotransmitter properties in the brain when you associate with substance use. What we don't know is if taking antidepressants and anti-anxiety agents, other than what I talked about in terms of benzos, if they actually cause some down regulation of natural production. Some, some believe they do, some believe that they don't. But I'm going to talk just a little bit about nutraceuticals. You know what I'm talking about when I talk about nutraceuticals, things that are not traditional medicines? Because you're all going to see me put patients on NAC. NAC is N-acetylcysteine. It's a precursor to a uh, neuropeptide in the brain called glutathione. And uh, we've used NAC for uh, a number of years. It is a potent anti-inflammatory antioxidant. As a matter of fact, if you get Tylenol poisoning and you go to the emergency room, they will have you breathe N-acetylcysteine in through thing. We also use N-acetylcysteine um, in people with respiratory illnesses like cystic fibrosis and things like that because of its potent antioxidant effects, right? But about 15 years, a number of years ago, they looked at NAC in terms of decreasing cravings for um, substances like heroin and cocaine and things like that. And the idea was that if you improve glutathione by taking N-acetylcysteine and it's a precursor to glutathione, glutathione seems to be responsible, ties in some... Remember I talked about here's anxiety and here's the person who drinks alcohol for their anxiety and that's a pathway in their brain. But then I said you can make new pathways in your brain. Well, some people, some researchers believe that glutathione not only is it a potent antioxidant, but it reinforces new learned behaviors. That's an interesting concept because they did studies that showed a decreased cravings for heroin, decreased cravings for cocaine. Never got popular because it's just a nutraceutical and nobody can make money off of it. Until along came the National Institutes of Health and they said to themselves, hey, we're all about medication assisted therapy for these substance use disorders, but what are we giving these young kids that smoke marijuana all day long? We don't have anything to give them to help with cravings. And by the way, if you look at the statistics, it's quite alarming because if you take a young adult who smoked marijuana in the morning, the afternoon, the evening, and at nighttime, he's smoking all day long, and you put them in treatment for 30 days of residential treatment, the relapse rates are probably greater than 90%. So what can we give them that'll assist them? And they say, well, remember NAC, those studies for NAC look pretty good. Let's, let's try an N-acetylcysteine. There's no side effects. It's just a nutraceutical, just an amino acid. And they did a, several studies. In one of those studies, there was a remarkable decrease in cravings reported for marijuana and in relapse on marijuana. So they started saying, well, let's give people NAC uh, to help with uh, uh, cannabis dependence. And it does help. It does work. And there's not, there's not a downside because it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, uh, there's no, no real side effects from NAC. And as a matter of fact, NAC is helpful, N-acetylcysteine is helpful for any habituated behavior. Maybe it's self-harm. Maybe it's binge eating. Or maybe it's gambling. As a matter of fact, um, there was a study in 2015 where they put young women who self-harmed to relieve emotional distress, they put them on NAC. I think 1,200 milligrams twice a day, and they monitored them for four months. They did a PET scan of their brain before and afterwards, and not only had they re the neck reduced their uh, frequency and intensity of self-harm, but within the PET scan, there was increased connectivity, neuronal path activity, basically, in the amygdala of the brain. So there's actually some biological evidence that NAC was improving the way the brain deals with emotional distress. And so I, I use knack a lot for patients because there's not a downside and I know it helps with this habituation. No matter what the behavior is, it doesn't have to be substance abuse. It can be gambling or, or sex addiction or any of those type of things. It does seem to help. It's not a, but you've got to do therapy. Yeah. I was going to ask, would that potentially have an adverse effect as well if someone were to be using NAC and they all of a sudden go back to using their substance? Would they reinforce the pathway? No, no, that's a very good question. So far, the literature, and this ties in with NMDA and all these other kind of things, but, the, but so far, we don't think that N-acetylcysteine or glutathione has any effect on established pathways only on new brain pathways. In other words, and now they're looking a lot at glutathione because of its potent antioxidant and anti-inflammatory benefits for dementia and Alzheimer's and things like that because it takes free radicals out of the brain. So it's probably a good nutraceutical from the standpoint that the cytopoke profile is so good and it does seem to help with habituated behaviors and it may be helpful for your brain as well. I mean, lots of people are taking it for that, not because of their habituation, but they're taking it for that, you know. The other thing that seems to be really 
important in all this, and I'm on video, but I'll say it anyway, uh, probably inflammation is what causes all illness and disease. Well, and most people sort of believe that now. We just don't know what causes the inflammation. Although I think somewhere down the road they're going to prove it's infection that causes inflammation. But if you can reduce inflammation, you can improve outcomes. As, and as a matter of fact, for example, with someone who has asthma, what really gets to them with lack of treatment in the long run is that they, all that inflammation causes scar tissue. And the scar tissue is what decreases lung function. So if you take a, like a steroid or something that decreases inflammation, you're actually helping that body because you're not getting that damage to the lungs. And that's why everybody's looking at anti-inflammatories now for the brain. If you can decrease inflammation, perhaps you won't have as much. Now I'm not talking about giving somebody an anti-inflammatory who's just doing fine. I'm talking about someone who's starting to have a problem with something or something happens like they just had a big traumatic brain injury or so forth, you know, then you may actually improve outcomes by decreasing inflammation. How you choose to do that is sort of up to you. I like omega-3s because they're potent anti-inflammatories and they don't have any really therapeutic uh, side effects other than if you use too much, you can uh, increase your risk for bleeding because they become antiplatelets at very, very high dose. But they do afford some anti-inflammatory benefits, you know. If, you even, if we haven't looked at, for example, I'll give you an example, like if this is an artery, what is everybody telling you about, you know, don't eat fat, don't eat saturated fats because you get plaques, right? And uh, a long time ago they said, well, um, what's going to happen is this plaque is going to break loose and just float down here to where the artery is small and then that's a, a heart attack. But here's an interesting thing. In, indigenous people in Alaska have very high levels of plaques in their arteries, but they don't have very little uh, heart disease. And I'm like, w why is that? Well, what we figured out was in these plaques become covered with a mucosal lining. And if they have a mucosal lining, you've restricted some of the flow, but there's no risk for a clot. Something breaks down that mucosal lining, and then that plaque platelets start to stick to that plaque and eventually it breaks loose and becomes a heart attack. Well, what causes that is inflammation. As a matter of fact, if you have a heart attack and you go in to see the doctor, you have the best, best cholesterol in the world and you will still end up on a statin. Why? Because cardiologists know that statins are potent, potent anti-inflammatories. <laughs> they reduce inflammation, so they reduce your risk of having a further heart attack, even if you have normal lipids, right? And so inflammation is the key there. There was some evidence uh, done with indigenous people that the, the belief was that you reduce this because you reduce the inflammation by because these indigenous people were eating uh, fish that was high in omega-3s, like salmon and so forth. And that therefore they were having more anti-inflammatory benefits and less risk of heart disease. Nobody's been able to prove that, but that's what the assumption is. So I was just making the point here that inflammation seems to be deleterious. Whoa, H how are we on time? How much? Like I got three minutes left? Yeah. Oh gosh. Okay, sorry. I was rambling on. I apologize. Um, it, does anybody have any questions about a particular type of medicine or, or t that I can answer? How could you naturally produce GABA? How could you naturally produce GABA? Um, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> Nobody knows, but some people believe it's demand. It's what? It's demand. Like when, when you get in situations that cause you to need GABA, then your brain interprets that it's time to start increasing our levels of GABA in the brain. In other words, uh, you probably don't want to live a very, uh, I don't know how to explain this, but you know, you, you, there, has to be some, there has to be some challenges in life. So your brain perceives that it's necessary. But we don't really understand the principle there. Your brain is very much likes to take neurotransmit or amino acids and convert them when it perceives there a, a need for it. And so I think that probably you would get, and oh, by this way, I, I, didn't, mean, I didn't mean to imply as well that you gotta take medicines, you gotta take nutraceuticals and stuff like that. I honestly believe that the best way you can get your amino acids and improve your neurotransmitter activity is by well-balanced, good diet. And, and, and our body actually likes it that way. You know, you used to always say you got to take calcium. Well, we found out that really your body doesn't like to get concentrated calcium. It likes to extract calcium from the food. And you have to have good vitamin D levels to do that. But um, anyway, so, so I don't know if there's a natural way that, that you can just improve. Uh, Gavin, you know, people ask me this question all the time because I give this lecture and I say, you know what? Neurotransmitters don't cross the blood-brain barrier. But you'll see me use Gavacom on patients for anxiety. 
And they say, why is that working for anxiety? Because I know that GABA will not cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, but GABA calm seems to help patients with their anxiety. Why is that? You do have GABA sites in the stomach. And your stomach is hooked to your heart and to your brain. So I think the binding in the stomach may have an impact on the brain. And that's why people feel less anxious. It's like a lozenge, a yeah. It's not homeopathic. It's just a nutraceutical. It is the neurotransmitter GABA. Plus, GABA calm, I think, has taurine in it as well, which is an a amino acid that's a precursor to uh, other things in the, other neurotransmitters in the body. But GABA seems to calm people down. They say, well, why does it work? And I said, I think it works because I think it binds in the stomach. You know, you have more uh, uh, serotonin sites in your stomach than you have in your brain. And that's why serotonin is so important for um, uh, your digestive system. And your GI, by the way, is where your immune system is at. And that's why, for example, Remeron, which is a type of antidepressant, you can use it at low doses and it will activate appetite and improve appetite in people even without its antidepressant benefit. It will improve their appetite because of how it binds in the stomach. What, any, other, any other questions? Yeah. Earlier you were mentioning how uh, schizophrenia is 100% biological and I'm good with that. I had a question though. Um, I had heard that, that the, especially the initial psychotic break is usually caused by some sort of traumatic or significant uh, social stressor. Right. So I'm wondering, is it just possible that if someone were to be raised in a healthy enough environment that you could prevent the initial psychotic break thus preventing the overall uh, diagnosis of schizophrenia, or will it eventually just inevitably happen? Uh, I think it's inevitably going to happen because the genes are coded for it. Um, and, and I agree with you. I mean, we all, and that's true too as well, um, that we know there's, there's some type of event that occurs it, it, that seems to trigger it. And by the way, that's why, you know, we talk about substance abuse. People always abuse a substance they shouldn't. These people... The biggest drug of a, a substance use issue for them is alcohol. Why is that alcohol is a neurodepressant? They shouldn't be drinking alcohol. You know what the biggest one is for people with psychosis, schizoaffective disorder, or manic depression, or schizophrenia? Hallucinogens. And I will guarantee you, we won't get into the we won't get into an argument about where cannabis or THC or marijuana is good for you or bad for you. But if you have psychosis, you better not smoke marijuana. And that, a lot of times, is the first event, is that use of hallucinogens. We also think there's a first event with uh, ADHD as well, attention deficit hyperactive disorder. We don't know, but we don't fully understand it. But ADHD, remember I said norepinephrine is responsible and helps with focus and concentration, even though it's an activating neurotransmitter. And if you give someone with ADHD a stimulant, like amphetamines, it improves norepinephrine in the brain, and they, but they don't get hyperactive. Like if you gave me epinephrine, I'd be like running around this room, crazy. But if you have that ADHD, then you have a paradoxical effect in the brain. It actually calms you down. Um, and we think with ADHD, which looks like a brain disorder as well, but yet it does respond to non you know, pharmaceutical intervention as well. There's a lot of therapies that can help with uh, 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 that particular problem, but amphetamines definitely helps with your focus and concentration. And we th so we think ADHD has. Uh, we don't know how to mark it on the brain. Although doctor, there's a clinic in California that believes he can identify the areas in the brain and which medicine you should take. But um, that they think there might be some event as well that triggers that onset of ADHD, even though you're sort of been primed for ADHD. And we do see ADHD run in families like we see bipolar on those run as well. But there are some kind of event. But that was a good question. Yeah. Anything else? I'm going to, hopefully, um, in the future, I'm going to hold another little uh, uh, lecture like this about just specifically about medications and how they work and what impact they have on neurotransmitters and why one is chosen over the other. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks for coming. I appreciate it.